See, that wasn't said enthusiastically by me this morning because I was too eager to get started. I wasn't interested in good morning. Only once in a great while does a thing like this happen that I have been up virtually all night with the subject that we're going to take up today. It's well rehearsed in my thought, well worked out, and it could uh, be that this may be the most important lesson you've ever heard on the message of the infinite way. I know that it will be if you understand it, if you grasp it, if you don't grasp it, make some uh, provision for studying it afterward, because there is no subject more important. I might say to you that there is no literature outside of the infinite way in all the world that I've ever discovered that covers this subject. It is one of the deep mysteries of philosophical and spiritual literature. And the reason is that trying to understand it with the intellect makes it an absolute impossibility to arrive at a satisfactory understanding because the subject deals with contradictions. Not only contradictions, but contradictions in scripture, as you will see. And uh, nobody that has tried to figure it out with the mind, with reason, with the intellect, has been able to come to any satisfactory conclusion. Now before we come to that, we will lead up to it by going back to the book, The Infinite Way. As I watch the work unfold, in this message. It seems strange to me at times, although I make very little comment about it, that so little actual study is given to the book The Infinite Way. It is read and it makes its impression and uh, the students go back to it occasionally and read some more, but I doubt that there are many who know that practically every paragraph in this entire book is a metaphysical and spiritual text upon which a whole book could be written. That this book, as small as it is, contains everything that we know up to date on the subject of spiritual unfoldment, spiritual living, and spiritual healing. Not a word can be added to this book, or perhaps I should say not a word has ever been added to this book. There isn't a single word in all the writings that isn't originally in this one book. The only thing is that sometimes it is in this book in one sentence and then appears later as a 10,000 or 25,000 word book, but it's the same sentence. It's the same statement, it's the same truth which could have been found in its pure essence and each one work out for themselves instead of having to read another book about it. Now, you will remember as I call it to your attention that the Infinite Way writings declare that the secret of life lies in right identification. That is, in knowing our true identity, in knowing who I am or what I am. All of the error in the world, all of the sin, disease, death, lack and limitation in the world is based only on one 
ignorance and that is ignorance of our identity not knowing who I am or what I am now of course in this book the infinite way the subject is treated quickly briefly and with just a statement here and there because it becomes necessary for an individual for a student to follow that through to its ultimate conclusion not for somebody to put it into words for them because then they'd be living on words instead of inner individual unfoldment also as this book came through it came through in such a manner so as not to shock the world into uh, just disregarding it and so you must naturally expect that uh, ideas are softened here which when you examine them you say do you really mean that that's what it means and I do I mean exactly that now here is a chapter metaphysical healing healings are always in proportion to our understanding of the truth about God, man, idea, body. Well, of course, there is just one sentence. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't know how you could spend less than a year on that one sentence. I don't know how you could possibly not write that sentence out, put it up on the mirror, carry a copy in the purse, and then regardless of what you're reading for the next year see what it has to say about God man idea body you see if we knew the truth about God and man the truth about idea and body would quickly reveal themselves because no one who hears these words will ever find their freedom until they know that they are not man as long as the belief exists consciously or unconsciously or subconsciously within you that you are man you will be seeking a God and there isn't any to be found the search for the Holy Grail has been a search for God always it has been fruitless always it has been a failure until the individual came home broke in health broken mind broken body broken purse and they had discovered it hanging right up on their own tree or buried in their own garden in other words within their own being now in the chapter supply in this book I gave the secret but evidently <coughs> too few of our students <coughs> have connected up that secret with the whole of being in the illustration of the orange tree I showed that the oranges do not constitute supply I don't care how many oranges there are I don't care how few oranges there are that has nothing to do with supply an orange or any other fruit on a tree is the product of a life force at work so the supply is the life force and the orange is but the fruitage or result or product of the supply you could have a year without oranges 
but that wouldn't mean you were without supply. You could, have, you could give away your oranges, you could throw them away, and you wouldn't be without supply because the life force is at work instantly reproducing. So you, at most you would have a temporary absence of the result of supply or product of supply or fruit of supply. Now coming back to our identity, who am I? What am I? And you'll find that you are not that which can be supplied. You are supply. You are the law of life operating. I am the life. I am life eternal. I am the life, the way, the truth. I am the bread, the wine, the meat. Do you not see that everyone, including our own students, have been trying to demonstrate meat, wine, water, house, health, when I am these? I am the life of my body. I cannot get life. I cannot get health. I cannot get supply, I cannot get youth, I cannot get vitality. I am the way, the truth, the life. Now, as men, we would have something to get, and we would have something to get it from. We would be eternally seeking a God somewhere, to get something for us, to give something, but all the way back to Moses it was realized, I am that very I am. I am it. And because of Moses' realization of I am, or Moses' realization that I am, he was enabled to bring forth a cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, manna from the sky, water from the rock, safety and security for his people, all by the realization. What set Moses apart from his people? They were seeking something from I am, and he was knowing that I am that I am. What set Jesus apart from his uh, multitudes? They were seeking to be fed, and he knew he could feed them. They were seeking to be healed, but he knew that I am life eternal and that that was their relationship to God, that was their true identity. Well, there's one tiny sentence in this book that says you must know that you are cause and not effect. I don't see how anyone could spend less than three years on that one sentence. And how they possibly can, because there isn't a single discord within range of your thought that isn't based on the belief that you are an effect and that there is a cause somewhere that can do something about it. The mystery of life is in the words, I am. Now. There is only one answer to the question, what is God? And that answer is, I am. Why is this true? Because if you say God is life, you're still leaving yourself out of the picture. God is life. Here am I back here looking up and declaring something out here. Oh, but you say, God is love. God is love. Where am I? Left out of that picture, because up here is God and over here is love. And here am I looking up there like Oliver Twist asking for a little more. Well, I am going to leave it with you 
to ponder this idea of yourself, capital S-E-L-F, as being God being, life, truth, love. And uh, go from there to the next step, which is man. Now remember, you are not man. You are life eternal. You are consciousness you are a state of consciousness. What state of consciousness? Well, close your eyes for a moment. And now notice that if you are to know anything at all, you must know it through your consciousness and that there is not a you and consciousness, but that which is the state of awareness is you. Now, if you are aware of yourself as finite personality, that is your state of consciousness. If you are aware of yourself as infinity, that is your state of consciousness, all right? How can you go from the belief of being a finite being to that of being an infinite being? Again, you close your eyes and you ask yourself this. If I want the answer to something that is back in memory, where do I get it? I go within my own being, I go down deep, and memory gives back to me that which I want to know. Ah. Supposing I require today some knowledge, the knowledge of driving an automobile or driving an airplane or the knowledge of uh, sewing or cooking, where do I go? I go down deep into myself and I draw forth that knowledge. But now supposing I want a knowledge of something heretofore unknown, let us say now there are no automobiles on the road, no airplanes in the sky, no radios, no television. But we've decided there should be these things and there can be these things. Now what do we do? We go way, way back into our consciousness and uh, gradually something begins to unfold to put us on the track of some knowledge and we find more and more and more until ultimately comes forth the entire wisdom that appears as an automobile. Do you remember in this little book is the illustration of Marconi. All of these great scientists were spending lifetimes wanting wireless telegraphy but not going toward the invention of it because they first must find what will enable the message to break down the resistance in the air and get through. And Marconi comes along and he knows that there is no resistance. Where did he discover there was no resistance? There wasn't such knowledge in books. Where did he discover that? Where did Moses discover that I am? Where did the master discover that my kingdom is not of this world? deep down within themselves. You say, but there was no such knowledge. No, but you must exist. You must acknowledge that it existed in infinity. It existed in what we call the mind of God, the soul of God. Well, dig down then into the mind of God. How do you get there? Go into your own mind, because that's the only mind there is. And that is God. And you there will find all of the knowledge that is in this world and all of the knowledge that has not yet evolved in this world. There are secrets to be learned about the sun, moon, and stars, and planets that man has never encompassed. But when that knowledge comes forth, where do you think it's going to come forth from? 
from the consciousness of an individual. He's going to find it deep down within himself and bring it forth and write it in a book for us to read. Don't you know that? Don't you know that all knowledge has been found within the consciousness of an individual? Then the consciousness of an individual is infinity. And we call that God. Truth is within ourselves. According to Browning, we must open out a way for the imprisoned splendor to escape. But truth is infinite. Within ourselves must be infinite. Now, can you imagine infinite being sitting around trying to demonstrate supply, health, companionship, and home when self is the source of these? So the secret of life, then, is right identification. Are you life or are you an effect of life? Are you the little oranges on the tree or are you the life force that produces oranges on your tree? That right identification changes your life the very minute that you begin to embody it. The moment you begin to accept why I am life eternal. I don't have to go out and get knowledge in a book. That won't make me life eternal. I don't have to go to man whose breath is in his nostril to learn something that will give me more life, use, or vitality. No, if I must go, I must go only for one purpose, and that is to learn that I already am that which I am seeking. That which I am seeking, I am. All that God is, I am. Why? For I and the Father are one and I am is that one. And when you say I am, you are declaring that. Now, that doesn't make your humanhood God. That makes your humanhood die. So that only God is left. Now then, The moment we realize that I am life eternal, that I am pure spirit, pure consciousness, we then come to the next great thing. What about this body? And there we find a mystery that has heretofore not been explained. Nowhere in any literature of the world has it been explained. It came to light in my consciousness during a class in uh, Portland, Oregon. It just came flowing out by inspiration. I knew nothing about it until that minute when it poured out and all of the passages of scripture that poured out with it, I wasn't consciously aware even of knowing. And uh, the tape recorder didn't work. But one of our students had made notes. And those notes I took to Seattle and spend a night in prayer, just as I did last night. And the next day, the message came through. And we will have it in just a few minutes. Now, let us remember this. If I am at all, then I must be embodied which means I must have a body. I cannot exist as just a uh, cloud drifting in the air, and even if I were a cloud drifting in the air, that would have form and body too. But I do have body. I am embodied, and my body, we, we learn in Scripture, is the temple of the living God. Now, Think a moment 
of conception the conception of a child and follow it along for three or four months until it becomes a perfect human form infant form but it has no life it is just a dangling piece of flesh in the mother's body whatever of life it has is the life of the mother not its own life but somewhere along in that fifth month the form itself becomes imbued with life there is a certain minute when it's a lifeless form and the next minute when it's a kicking lively form and it is in that second that it has life of its own now which is the child that body or that life couldn't be the body because that body was nothing but uh, lifeless flesh it wasn't any more life than an appendix's life it was just an appendage in the mother's form but in a certain instant life came now life is that baby not the form but life but that baby had form before the physical form awakened to life because it had to have a form in order to transmit itself and so the life of the babe was invisible and its form was invisible and then in a split second it took visible form and upon birth we could behold it even before birth the mother was aware of it as a living form as a live body as a live being as a baby but we only became aware of it after its birth and then we beheld it as a living form but as life it existed before conception where how that is not given to us to know at this present moment but we do know that somewhere somehow life existed and that at a certain moment it became visible to our awareness now then as we look at that infant form we can say aha that isn't your life because I remember when life wasn't there so this isn't you this is your form there is a you separate and apart from this form and there is a you that has form invisible to my sight now we have right identification because we know now that this infant actually is life or life constitutes this infant and that life, this life had form that could transmit itself and so we know now that that which we are viewing as body represents our view or our concept of that body and mothers have been known to say that it was a beautiful baby too we know there are no beautiful babies when they're born but the mother doesn't know that because she is looking at it through different eyes than we are so she is seeing her concept of her baby and we are just seeing our concept of baby period all right so it is with all of us we look out upon each other and we see forms which we call bodies ah uh, yes but our husband or wife may see something entirely different than we see mother or father may see something entirely different than we see sister and brother see something entirely and yet it's all the same body the same form no it isn't no it isn't in each case what we are seeing represents our concept of that which is there and uh, in one case we we are just indifferent to it as body and in another case we are vastly uh, indifferent and otherwise very otherwise then indifferent now once the realization comes that I am life eternal you can then look out and say well I have form 
I have body. And my form and my body represents the instrument through which I walk the earth. I could walk the earth without a form or body, but that would be invisible to you. That is why when you read these stories of the Orient, and you read of the masters who could transport their bodies through space, without any element of time do not disbelieve that for a single moment because not only it was true it still is true but that vision is not beheld by man whose breath is in his nostril it is only beheld by those of uh, his own state of consciousness in other words if a master transports himself from northern India to southern India, you can bet that only another master is seeing him. The man in the street is saying, that's nonsense. Why? Because like Thomas, I must handle it. In other words, I believe only my own concept. That is the secret of the resurrection. Never doubt for a moment that Jesus rose from the tomb. Never believe for a moment that the multitudes that he healed witnessed it. We are told that only 518 witnessed it. Well, 518 may have been 58 or 6,018, we don't know. We do know this, nobody witnessed it except those of such a high spiritual atmosphere that they could perceive that which finite human sense could not behold. Now the lesson of the resurrection is this. The master was no magician. He did no tricks for people. Nor did he ever do anything to impress anyone with what a great fellow he was. Never. When the resurrection took place, a principle was revealed to mankind. You never die, nor does your body ever stay in a casket or in an oven. Never. Never. To gross material sense, to the gross material sense which has accepted this to be me, to them there will be a funeral, a burial, or a cremation. But to those of illumined consciousness who never did believe that this was me, Joel will always walk the earth for them. You will always walk the earth for me. Never, never will I consign you to a tomb or to an oven. As far as I am concerned, you will walk this earth within three hours after you seem to take your departure from it because I know who and what you are and I won't be looking for you in the tomb of flesh. He is not here in the tomb, the guard says. He is risen. That's a principle. You are not here in the tomb of flesh. Now this is true not only when you're dead, it's a human sense. This is true now. You are not buried in this tomb we call a human body. You are not in it. No surgeon has ever been able to find you inside of a form. Whether they operate from the brain to the toenails, they cannot find you because you are not entombed in body. Body is embraced in you. And uh, it is as much an instrument for you as your dollar bills are instruments. Dollar bills do not constitute your wealth. You constitute your wealth, the life which you are, and the dollar bills are the instrument which you use as activities of exchange, modes of exchange. So with a body. As an infant, you had one body. 
but you exchanged it like you exchange your dollar bills and you exchanged it for the body of a child and when you uh, outgrew it you exchanged that body for the body of youth when you were through with that you exchanged that body for the body of adulthood in that body you found something that was in none of your previous bodies you found the power to reproduce yourself that wasn't in your infant body that wasn't in your childhood body now in this new body of youth and adulthood you found uh, this new power ah but as you advanced into years you lost that power again why because now you didn't need it now that was not a necessary function of your experience to be a parent now you go on to higher modes of life or different ones if they're not higher they're different and so you leave behind yourself your dolls and toys then you leave behind the rattles and school uh, the uh, marbles and school books then you leave behind the parenthood each time you leave behind a function of your life and you leave behind a part of your body and you acquire a different body and a different function of life and you go on now because this is unknown just about the time when uh, we no longer uh, have the faculty to become parents we look on this as a horrible thing that's happened to us because it's old age and now we have nothing left but death or being a grandparent but in spiritual wisdom we find this is not true that everything up to the period of uh, being finished as parents has been only a preparation for our leaving behind the material sense of world with its cares and a preparation for entering the spiritual unfoldment of life that is why it is not as easy to interest the young in spiritual things as the older not because the older are just afraid of dying and want to know something about God but because the younger still have functions on the human plane which they have not outgrown it would be a wonderful thing if they could learn the spiritual wisdom as an adjunct to their physical lives and it does happen in some cases but very often it's necessary for them to outgrow the physical sense of life before they're ready to enter the spiritual sense of life now we come to this point then that you must understand your body and you must understand that you are not this body and this body is not you this body is an instrument through which you are functioning you are the life of the body you are the soul of the body you are the intelligence of the body you are that which says up down left right you are that which writes or paints or sculpts or composes you are that which buys or sells but the body is the instrument which is always obedient to you now in the lower forms of life the ignorant and very often the illiterate the body is the master of the person and uh, the bodily functions control the person and the person seems to have no control over their body but the moment one rises into spiritual light in some measure they possess the body they govern the body they begin to use their bodies in the directions they wish to use them which of course by then is always along the line of intelligence and so forth now the body itself is as spiritual as we are this that we see is a mental concept of that body it's only a concept because it isn't what it is 
if this were what it is, then it would always be what it is. But because this is my concept of what it is, it changes. And one day it seems uh, healthier, and one day sick, and one day young, and one day old, one day pretty, and one day not pretty, all depending on what? It? No. On what my view of it is. So therefore, we are never seeing the body. We are seeing a human concept of body. And so we come to this mystery of the body. And remember that all of this is in the infinite way in short sentences, even though here it takes a whole book to explain it. This is called flesh and flesh. And I hope that someday it will be the chapter of a new book. And it starts with a quotation from 1 Timothy. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And after that mystery of godliness, there is a colon. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. The mystery of godliness is what? God was manifest in the flesh. I appear as body. I function through body. I am seen in the world as body. I am not seen. I am seen in the world as body. I am seen in the world as flesh. Now, the Master's entire message and mission was to teach us that we are the children of God. I and my Father are one. He that seeth me seeth him that sent me. And he was careful to include us in this relationship with God because always he said my father and your father the master knew that his teaching was of no value if it set him apart from the rest of the world of what value would his teaching and example be if literally he was something that God sent to earth for the purpose of teaching something that we were unable to live up to I came forth from the father and am come unto the world Therefore, we also are immaculately conceived, and ours is the birth and mission of the children of God. We are not mortal flesh as we seem to be. The mystery of godliness is in the realization of God incarnate as your individual being and mine. God manifest in the flesh, which means that God constitutes individual selfhood that God is the life, substance, and very form of our true being. Since God is the life of your being, you have no godliness of your own, no integrity, no purity, no loyalty or fidelity. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Whatever your capacities, abilities, and qualities may be, they are of God and not of yourself. Be not wise in your own conceits. In this realization, you gradually begin to lose the sense of personal selfhood and to indulge less in the personal I. And as you consciously live with the idea that God constitutes your being and that God is responsible for your supply, your activity and success, more and more you realize that the responsibility rests upon God. Then it is that you turn to the source of all good the creative principle, the Father within, that God may reveal itself and its plan. Everything has its basis in the invisible, appearing visibly and tangibly. And as you begin to comprehend that fact, you will see that creation is an act of an invisible principle, visibly manifest. God incarnating itself as manifest form. 
not the form you see with your eye, but form. The master's words were, and call no man your father upon earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. God is the creative principle of this universe, appearing as infinite form and variety, manifesting itself visibly as individual being, and therefore the mystery of godliness lies in knowing that God is your selfhood. God is your self. The subject of flesh or body has always been a puzzle to the world. And great perplexity arises on this point. Where do flesh and body fit into the spiritual scheme? Even in scripture we find statements such as flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There shall no flesh be justified in his sight no flesh shall have peace all flesh shall perish together for if ye live after the flesh ye shall die all flesh is grass the flesh profiteth nothing on the other hand we find such statements as yet in my flesh shall I see God I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. In the greatest scriptural passage on this subject, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In order to understand the subject of flesh and body, we must understand the meaning of these seemingly contradictory passages, which are not contradictory at all. They are no more contradictory than when we read in the Infinite Way writings that God is the only power, and then as we advance in consciousness, we learn that God is not power. When you ask, what is power? The answer is God, or spirit is power. But it is not meant in the sense that God is a power over something, circumstance, or condition. In other words, God is the only operative power in consciousness. God is law. Spiritually, the word flesh means embodiment, or body. Therefore, God becomes manifest as flesh, as form, as individuality. The word flesh can be used in thought, as for instance a law of natural science, such as gravity. The law of gravity was discovered when a scientist observed that every time an object was dropped or permitted to fall into space, it gravitated downward toward the earth, and thus the law of gravity became flesh. It has taken form in consciousness. And the law of gravity, which has always existed, now has a tangible body. It always had a body, because it always existed as an operative law. But now it has another body, a body of knowledge, awareness, in our consciousness. It becomes tangible. It becomes embodied within consciousness. In the same way, the laws of aerodynamics and electricity have always existed. And because they always existed, they had form or flesh. They existed as the word, the invisible and unknown law, intangible, unwitnessed, until one day these laws took form in the human mind. Long before the first airplane flew or the first bulb gave forth light, it had become flesh. It had taken form, it had become concrete, was witnessed, evidenced, and manifest. From then on, all that was necessary was to externalize it in another form of flesh. The moment a man knew about electricity and electric lights, it had form, body. Then when he brought it into the external, it had that which we know as form and body, the form and body that we behold. But you see that it must have had form and body in the mind of Edison or the mind of Ford or the mind of anyone else. So with art or music, it has form in the artist or composer's consciousness, definite form and sound and beauty and then outwardly it has another form when it appears as uh, sheets of music or paintings on or sculpture do you see the difference here we are dealing now with the fact that we are embodied in the mind of God as spiritual form then we appear outwardly in some uh, 
uh, concept of form and uh, that concept is changeable that concept is destructible because it is finite those of you who remember the uh, Model T Fords and now the V8s can see how the outer form or concept changes but the principle of automotive engineering is the same the principle is the same the only thing different is its outer form we have the same with everything there is whether we send messages through wires or messages through air the form in the mind is the same it takes outer expression as wire or outer expression as going through air do you see the difference now spiritually the word which is God the unmanifest becomes manifest as the Christ or Son of God and it is now a manifested idea in consciousness and so Christ the Son of God is our invisible being and this is its visible evidence you and I individually including our forms is the visible outward evidence of our invisible Christhood we exist in the bosom of God as Christ we appear on earth as the son of man we are the self same Christ externalized as form individuality but finite because we change not merely from infancy to adulthood but we change as to quantity and quality this is the relationship between God and your infinite eternal individual being God is your selfhood in the mind which is God you are flesh manifest evidenced witnessed you are God incarnate you are form you are individuality thus it is that all those who have ever lived who now live and who will live exist now in the flesh in spiritual form and integrity eternality and immortality and it is of those whom we read yet in my flesh I shall see God in my spiritual consciousness individuality I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh in other words we in our flesh spiritual identity we can know God we can be as gods we can uh, think it not unseemly to do the works of God in our spiritual identity which we are regardless of this thing here which we are in our inner being now the word flesh as it is referred to in scriptural passage, passages flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God there shall no flesh be justified in his sight no flesh shall have peace can be translated into the word concepts these earthly and human concepts will never be spiritual and they will never reveal God that body which is observed by the human senses is not body it is a universal concept of body it has no existence except in the mind the body is the word made flesh but because the physical sense has intervened all you can see is the concept of body that concept must die even the concept that you entertain of yourself must die for that concept can never know God as you entertain a concept of yourself as man as effect as sinful as sickly as human that concept of yourself must die until you become aware no I am that I am and that is what I am when that realization comes your old concept of yourself has died you have fulfilled Paul's statement you must die daily you must be reborn of the spirit that concept must die even the concept that you entertain of yourself must die for that concept can never know God 
It can never know reality. It is only as you refrain from judging by appearances and through a transformation of consciousness, be ye therefore transformed through the renewing of your mind. Let God define what you are and who you are, that the answer will be, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In reality, you are the beloved Son, the Word made flesh. But that flesh is an infinite individuality and an infinite body that is eternal. In this spiritual realization of your individual embodiment, you can truly say, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Flesh beheld through the senses is our concept of our real identity. Flesh apprehended spiritually in meditation is our spiritual form, not only of body, but of being. God, in individualizing itself as your being and mine, has been made flesh evident tangible. The word became flesh. That which you behold with the senses is the world's concept of flesh. That concept is changeable and it must die, either through acceptance of the world's judgment and belief of age and disease and death, or by a transformation of consciousness. The decision lies with you. God has no pleasure in your dying. Turn ye and live. If you accept the world's concept of age and disease, that concept will know death, and nothing can save it. On the other hand, you can bring about its death yourself in a painless way, by outgrowing it. As you realize more and more the nature of the Word made flesh, you drop the mortal concept of flesh and ultimately find yourself with a diseaseless, ageless, and painless body. As you live in the conscious realization of God as the source and creative principle of your being and of your body, and as you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will die to the flesh through transformation the body will show forth ever better appearance, youth, vitality, and strength. Outwardly it will appear as an improved concept, but it will not be, it will be your realization made manifest. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Take the word consciousness there instead of spirit. If ye, through your consciousness of truth, do mortify the deeds of the body. In other words, if you live by that which has externalized form, that is a concept, that concept must die. For instance, one who lives and depends solely upon money and the externals for his supply must eventually die, for this is the flesh that is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. Man shall not live by reliance upon matter, by forms, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In his great wisdom, the Master teaches us that we need have no concern for anything that has outer form. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I have meat to eat that ye know not of. That bread and that meat is the inner flesh that is in and of God. In my Father's house are many mansions, many states of consciousness, many embodied forms, and these will externalize themselves in infinite forms and varieties of what we call flesh. Enjoy all good that comes to you, but do not cling to it or depend upon it. Be willing to see it come and be willing to see it go always making room for greater unfoldments from within. The inner flesh is unchangeable, but it keeps externalizing itself in ever new, higher, finer forms. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. A transformation is taking place in your consciousness, and it is breaking up the old patterns in order that the new life may come forth. This may be a painful process, but the pain comes because of wanting to hold and cling to the old. You must be willing to undergo that transformation of consciousness and to let go your old thought patterns and body forms in order to emerge into the flesh which is seen and understood as your real, eternal, and infinite individuality. 
this flesh will continuously externalize itself in newer and finer forms of body and bodily functions which will be the externalization of your higher state of consciousness. Our work is not to get rid of the body, but rather to be clothed upon with a new concept of body. At some time we will all put off this outer envelope and step out into a higher heritage, for we know that if our earthly house of the tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Some will die after the flesh, and some will voluntarily lay down this form for a higher one, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Do you see now that it is absolutely necessary that we not ignore subjects like body and flesh and turn away from them as if they were something to be uh, hidden or covered up or... Uh, ashamed of, but must be taken into our consciousness and transformed until we see that body is the temple of the living God. And then this outer form becomes more nearly like it in appearance. Now, if I know that I am consciousness, then I know that that constitutes this form. Now I have no concern for body. And so if you pluck out an eye, the next one can grow again. Because you're not losing anything of immortality, only a concept of our existence. And so it is, if I think that there is a me and that there is a God, I lose my demonstration. But when I know God is my being, my selfhood, my consciousness, then I know that I myself am the law or the life or the truth that appears visibly as my daily experience. Do you see that? It is right identity. It is when I realize that all cause is embodied in my own being and that that cause is forever appearing as effect. Therefore, effect can die daily in order that the new form can be bought, can be formed and expressed and revealed. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you.